Thank you very much. Thank you. I am delighted to be here. I do have one correction, though. Volume two is actually was split in two, so it's not two separate volumes. And in fact, if you buy just half, you either get the introduction and the table of contents, or you get the the uh, end part, bibliography, and index. So. <laughs> You have to buy both. It was I published it originally in one big fat book, but Erdman says it was just too much and too expensive, so that's why they split it. So people have been teasing me that I now have a secunda prima pars and secunda pars. <laughs> totally not my plan, but anyway, it's there. So um, you'll notice I gave you a pretty hefty handout. The reason I'm doing that is I was asked to give a description of all the works in about 45 minutes. So I decided it's impossible. I tried for a while. And so what I've done is I have an outline where I summarize some of the key points in each section of history of philosophy and theology, what we're looking at. But to find the facts or any evidence or the dates, I gave you this chart with dates on it. The facts and footnotes have all the sources with quotes from what I'm going to be arguing. So it's, for me, it's looks, it sounds thin because I'm just going to describe it to you. But there's a lot of meat in the books if you really want to find out what, where the sources are that I'm taking these things from. So I'm going to divide the talk into two parts. And I'm going to stop at the end of part four for about five minutes, at which time I'm going to ask you to take five minutes and talk with your neighbor. And I have a couple of questions that I'll give you just to do that. Give me a little break. And uh, you break, too. So to begin, then, come, Holy Spirit, come, and renew the face of the earth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a Catholic philosopher, I follow the guidance of fetus et ratio by respecting the autonomy of a philosophical methodology, working in complement with the Catholic faith. In this presentation, I will describe some key persons in the history of philosophy contributed to the developing concept of woman from ancient Greek philosophy to the present. The evidence for my claims can be found in volume one, which is subtitled The Aristotelian Revolution, 750 BC to 1250 AD. Volume two, The Early Humanist Reformation from 1250 to 1500. And volume three, Search for Communion of Persons, 1500 to 2015. A handout is provided with this lecture to guide you through these claims. It provides dates and summarizes different positions and theories articulated by authors in four communities of discourse, broadly described as academic, satirical, religious, and humanist. I approach these authors through the pathway of what they said about the concept of woman. This naturally opens up to the dimension of what they said about men in relation to women. In the handout, I also mention seven criteria that blessed John Henry Newman identified for testing a true development of a living idea. These are all worked out in detail in volume three of the concept of woman, but it is not possible to focus on them in this lecture. I'll just mention that two living ideas are central to the dignity of human gender, which is the theme of the lecture. The first is the soul body composite identity of a single human being, female or male. And the second is the integral complementarity of a woman and a man. And I know we're sensitive today for exceptions, people that are not, don't see themselves as totally female or male. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. We always, dignity is for everyone. Every human being has dignity because we are all called to eternal life. I welcome disagreement about my claims. I'm a philosopher, so I love a good discussion. And I eagerly wait to hear them or see them in print. And I hope that my research has helped to open a new subfield of studies within the area of the history of philosophy identified as philosophical anthropology. This field draws upon a descriptive metaphysics, which situates the concept of woman in a theory of gender reality with implications 
for Ethics and Political Philosophy. Okay, part one, Gender and Ancient Greek Philosophy. The pre-Socratic philosophers together asked questions which delineated four categories within the concept of woman. The metaphysical question asked, are male and female opposites, contraries, or the same? The philosophy of nature question asked, what does a mother or father contribute to generation? Does it have any effect on their respective identities? The theory of knowledge question asks, do women and men have the same or different capacities for knowledge? And are they wise by knowing the same or different things? The ethics and political question focused on whether men and women are good by doing the same or different things. I summarize these four questions within a bracket. I was a math major before I became a philosophy major. So my bracket has opposites, comma, generation, comma, wisdom, comma, and virtue end of the bracket. This bracket served me as a grid which I applied to each author I studied. I studied the complete works of each author in order to respect the dignity of the, dignity of the writer as a whole rather than to isolate one particular position and ignore others. I was reminded that it's not quite that way in my final volume because I was rushing to finish. So I don't have the whole philosopher there, but I often published articles about the whole philosopher where they are referred to in the book. So when there is a discrepancy, I hold the tension of a discrepancy, which is resolved by a later author. What I mean by discrepancy is a contradiction within the work itself, you know, about the concept of women, where it's not consistent. None of the pre-Socratic authors provided a consistent theory across all four categories in the grid. Perhaps they tried to do so in their writings, but the fragments do not allow us to reach a conclusion. Plato was the first philosopher who provided enough information to defend a theory of the concept of woman across all four categories in the grid. I identify him as the founder of the unisex theory. By drawing upon all of his work, including his myths, I argue that Plato thought there are no significant differences between a woman and a man in the category of relation to opposites, generation, wisdom, and virtue. He suggested that the unisex soul is reincarnated into different bodies, male, female, human, and animal. The female is a weaker incarnation, punished for cowardliness or immorality in the past life, but with the proper education in the Republic and laws that took a female a little more time than the male, a woman could achieve the same wisdom and virtue as a man and participate in all the same activities, including citizenship and governing. Aristotle was the second philosopher who provided enough information across all four categories in the grid to defend a theory about the concept of woman. I identified him as the founder of the traditional sex polarity theory. The traditional sex polarity theory holds that the male is superior to the female, female in all four categories of opposites, generation, wisdom, and virtue. You can come and sit up on the floor in the front if you want. I know there are a couple empty seats here too. I don't mind, wherever you're comfortable. You're okay, all right. Aristotle dedicated book 10 chapter 9 of his Metaphysics to the question of whether the difference between male and female is enough to constitute a difference in species. He gave a negative answer to the question about whether male and female sexers, sexes differ in species. Since a species has a common form, he argued that the male and the female beings are contraries within the same human species. In other words, a man and a woman have the same human form, but the contraries of hot and cold, which he thought mitigated the ability of a human being to produce fertile seed, they operate in such a way that the female as colder is the derived contrary of the male, contrary of the male who is hotter. If any of you know your ancient Greek philosophy, you know that's a Pythagorean idea that, they, that Aristotle adopted. Even though Aristotle was an empiricist, 
He and many philosophers for over 2,000 years did not understand the true nature and importance of ovulation for a woman's identity. He thought that the man's contribution of one seed form or soul power is always and only immaterial and the woman's contribution is always and only material as it being just the menstrual blood. Aristotle's drive for consistency led him to argue that the female as a defective or misbegotten male also developed her rational powers less well than the male. Consequently, a woman's irrational powers were not well governed by her rational powers. Her virtue was to be silent in public and to be ruled by her husband. Aristotle did allow for an occasional exception, but in general his theory argued that the female is by nature inferior to the male in all four categories. He also, I didn't put this in the paper, but it's in the book. He also does, tried to explain how a female child is born, and it's basically because the mother's menstrual blood does not perfectly receive the form of the father, form power, which he gave. It would be a boy that looked like the father if it was a perfect reception. So he was consistent everywhere, consistently wrong on all of this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but he has some great, great sides to him, which I'm going to tell you about right now. At the same time, as Aristotle forged his tightly argued theory about man's natural superiority to woman, he also offered some important claims that have become foundational for the truth about woman and man today. For example, he argued that science is about what is always or for the most part true. Exceptions in nature were to be expected, but they did not destroy the rule. Aristotle also correctly stated that by male animal is meant one who generates in another, and by female is meant one who generates in the self. And those are both true statements that we can accept today. Aristotle also identified the principle of hylomorphism, which is the soul body composite unity of an individual man or individual woman in the De Anima on the Soul, is the book that he wrote about that in. In spite of the failures of his own theory of sex polarity, the principle of hylomorphism, after it is developed, will be essential for the defense of the integral gender complementarity of a man and woman, which I'll explain to you what that is in just a minute. There are many problems with Aristotle's hylomorphism and his theory of generation, which has to be developed and corrected by later philosophers and scientists. But in spite of Aristotle's constant devaluation of the dignity of woman vis-a-vis -vis man, he offered a correct position about the human being as a soul body, form matter composite. That's the end of section one. Section two, gender in medieval philosophy. In the medieval period, the theories of ancient Greek philosophers came into contact with the dignity of the human gender through scriptures. The book of Genesis reveals four essential principles of man-woman complementarity. The first principle is the equal dignity of all human beings, revealed in Genesis 1.26. Let us make man, the human being, in our image after our likeness. The second principle of significant difference between a woman and man is revealed in Genesis 1.27. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The third principle of synergetic relation of a woman and a man is revealed in Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them and said to be fruitful and multiply. And in Genesis 2.24, they became one flesh. The fourth principle of intergenerational fruition is revealed in Genesis 5, 1 through 32. This is the book of the generations, and in the subsequent listing of the names of those who generated one generation after another from Adam to Noah. In the New Testament, the dignity of woman and man was further elevated by Jesus Christ when he assumed human nature at the incarnation. His passion, death, resurrection, and ascension 
opened up the pathway to women and men to share life in union with the divine persons in the Holy Trinity and the communion of saints. According to scripture, this shared inheritance of eternal life is unique to human beings and open to all human beings. Now, our sisters, some, many of them think the dogs also were up there. Other animals, too. I mean, it's a, it's a controversial issue among people that love animals. But that's, <laughs> that's what the scripture says, so there may be more than that. St. Hildegard of Bangen accepted the soul-body composite identity of each individual human being. Oops, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. After Plato's unisex and Aristotle's sex polarity theory about the concept of woman in relation to man, nothing new occurred in Western philosophy on this theme until St. Augustine, who observed in the City of God, Book 12, Chapter 17, that some people think that when women are resurrected, they will become men. This would be a logical conclusion to draw from Aristotle's position that the female is a defective male. St. Augustine argued against this position by saying that a woman's identity is not a defect, but her natural state. He concludes that there will be women and men in heaven in the integrity of their bodies and sex. Augustine's reasoned argument provides the first two parts of an integral sex complementarity model of men and women in heaven. That is, they're simultaneously equal in dignity as human and significantly different as women and men. Unfortunately, in speaking about the respective identities of a woman and a man on earth, Augustine described widows, including his mother Monica, and nuns as more like a man, using a platonic unisex model. He also described a married woman by herself as not in the image of God. He stated that only when a woman is joined with her husband who by himself represents the image of God, can she also be considered as in the image of God. Thus, Augustine was not a consistent defender of the theory of integral complementarity of woman and man. And I'll just add here, unfortunately, many scholars take one sta statement, like there's not in the image of God, it's a famous book, and it has Augustine, that's what he says. It's the only thing they put in about what he says. So, it, it takes the one isolated point and makes the man representing just that. And so it's not a true description of Augustine's theory, which, as we know, in the City of God, argued very clearly that in, in heaven, men and women are both there in the integrity. But he wasn't consistent. So this is where you have an example where there's a tension in the, alter, sorry, in the author and in the reader from that inconsistency. So I just held those tensions. I still think it's a movement forward because Augustine really took on what it, the resurrection means. St. Hildegard of Bengen, the Benedictine abbess and doctor of the church, was the first person to offer a complete theory of complementarity of woman and man across all four categories in the grid, opposites, generation, wisdom, and virtue. So I put her theory out there for you to see on one of those worksheets. Um, she uses medieval science of elements and humors. So the, the sciences itself we wouldn't accept, but her arguing shows that she tried in every case to bring a balance between the male and the female. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I identify her as the founder of sex and gender complementarity. St. Hildegard of Bengen provides a consistently true development from Augustine's limited claim about the integral complementarity of a woman and a man in heaven. She accepted the soul body composite identity of each individual human being and described it with beautiful natural metaphors. She also affirmed male and female differentiation within human identity after the resurrection in the integrity of their bodies and their sex. Drawing upon this medieval science of humors and elements, Hildegard tried to bring a balance into polarity discussions, while Aristotle characterized woman as like the two, oldest, sorry, two lowest elements of earth and water, and men as like the two highest elements of fire and air. Hildegard said, no, man is like the highest and the lowest, the lowest because he's created of the earth, and woman is like the two middle ones. So you can see how she brings the balance in. 
In generation, she claimed that the man deposited cold seed into a woman who then warmed it up. Developing the synergetic dimension of how a woman and man are the work of one another, Hildegard offered descriptions of four kinds of women and four kinds of men, and the qualities of their interaction, children, health, and diseases. Her philosophical writings about the concept of women match the originality of her theological writings on this topic. So there's a lot more you can explore there, and it's there in the book, but it just shows you how she sits in relation to the other. She's a doctor of the church. Pope Benedict also made her a doctor of the church, and his letter on why he did is very, very powerful. The richness of a lived integral complementarity within the Benedictine age of Western history was due in part to the fact that the Benedictine monasteries often had men and women studying together or sharing a common library. They're what we call double monasteries. This model was soon to change with the development of the mendicant orders, and in particular of the Dominicans, and the shifting of the centers of education away from the monasteries to the universities and the cities. In the middle of the 13th century, at the same time as the universities for men only were established across Europe, Aristotle's manuscripts were translated into Latin. 1255, Aristotle became required reading at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Paris as antecedent to the graduate faculties of theology, medicine, and law. Most other universities in Europe followed the model of curriculum at Paris to constitute what I call the Aristotelian revolution in the concept of women. All the rationale for the natural superiority of man in all four categories of the grid had found their new locus for dominating thought about women's identity within the academic world of universities. While St. Albert the Great always and St. Thomas Aquinas sometimes drew upon an Aristotelian rationale to support a natural inferiority of women to men, Following Abelard, they also tried to make a distinction between universal nature, which always wanted to generate both women and men, and particular nature, which aimed towards generating a male, but missed the mark when it generated a female. St. Thomas also, though, introduced in the Summa Contra Gentilis another possibility, namely that the diversity between generating a male or a female can be explained from a diversity in God's commensuration of souls to particular bodies, since it is as forms that souls have to be adapted to particular bodies. This suggestion of Thomas takes away any of the lack of dignity associated with the Aristotelian theory of the female as a misbegotten or defective male. Thomas Aquinas also developed Aristotle's theory of the soul as the form of the body into being a substantial form, which is simultaneously form and spirit. The same soul is a development from Aristotle that Thomas gave. This true development by Thomas of the human soul as both form and spirit provides a stronger foundation for the later development of the integral complementarity of woman and man. End of part two. Part three, gender and humanist philosophy. In the 14th to 15th centuries, Christine de Pizan, an Italian widow, lived in Paris under the protection of Jean Gerson, who gave her a study in the library at the Sorbonne. She had three children and other relatives whom she port, supported by writing 41 books. She's the first person to earn her living at all, man or woman, by writing. At that time, numerous satires denigrating women and marriage circulated throughout Europe. They worked by either exaggerating characteristics of women, such as passivity, out-of-control emotions, or by inverting characteristics of women and men. Christine de Pizan vigorously engaged in public debate with male humanists. She also directly challenged satirical arguments of Theophrastus, Ovid, Jean de Meun, Matteolus and Walter Matt. She countered gender polarity arguments about women as naturally passive, weak, wise through true opinion only, or virtuous through silence. She was an expert logician who understood how to use the reductio ad absurdum argument form, providing evidence for women as active, strong, wise, and 
through careful reasoning and universal judgments reached through syllogisms. She described women who are models of self-knowledge and self-governance. In her City of Women, based on Augustine's City of God, Christine de Pizan, however, began to slide a little towards reverse sex polarity that viewed women as superior to men. <laughs> With the influx into northern Italy of Platonic texts and the holding of small schools within the homes of wealthy families, women began to engage in dialogues with men about sex and gender identity. Soon dialogues about women's identity emerged. Cassandra Fidele, Isata Nogarola, and Laura Serretta began to articulate original arguments that enter collective historical discourse for subsequent philosophical work in this area. The German humanist Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa wrote a short text titled The Superiority of Woman Over Man. He interpreted scripture to state that since creation went in a hierarchical sequence and woman was created last from the refined bone of man, she was superior to man. He gave many other arguments, but that was one. Lucretia Marinale was the most significant author defending what I call reverse sex polarity, that is the natural superiority of woman over man. She argued in several volumes directly against Aristotle's positions to demonstrate that women's virtues were superior to men's virtues and that men's vices were worse than women's vices. And she used Aristotle's ethics as the, uh, the structure for her arguments, but using it against Aristotle himself. The introduction of masculinity and femininity as a specific topic for philosophical reflection marks an advance in the concept of woman and of man, at the same time as it contains stereotyped understanding of the two categories. Instead of having a, just a one-dimensional beginning point of female or male sex for gender identity, a two-dimensional triangular understanding of a male with masculine and feminine characteristics, or a female with feminine and masculine characteristics began to occur. It will take another several hundred years for clarifications about what masculine and what feminine mean, and whether each one is accidental or essential to the identity of a woman or man. Just as the Benedictines had the strongest influence on the concept of woman in relation to man in early medieval philosophy, the Dominicans had the strongest influence on the concept of woman in later medieval and early modern philosophy. In modern philosophy through the 20th century, the Carmelites will make the greatest contribution to discussions about gender. Later in the sequence of Carmelites are St. Teresa of Avila, Doctor of the Church, and St. John of the Cross. Both of these authors use the categories of masculine and feminine characteristics to describe many aspects of their spiritual lives. They develop the soul body composite identity of a human person to include descriptions from within, and so the soul was opened up to include spirit, which it already did with St. Thomas, and psyche. So you have the soul with both other dimensions, spirit dimension and psyche dimension, composite, body composite. So you can see the developing understanding of what the human person is in terms of a soul body composite. In addition, they elaborated on the analogy of spiritual marriage, depending on whether your starting point was as a woman or as a man. They also exemplified genuine friendship between a woman and a man. That's the end of the, that's the, the huge volume, is, that's the summary of it right there. <laughs> okay, gender in modern philosophy. Two religious events occurred near the beginning of the 1500s that overturned stereotype gender identity associations of a woman and a man. In 1531, a pregnant woman identifying herself as Mary of Guadalupe appeared to Juan Diego on a hill near Mexico City. Her conversation included frequent references to her will, her venerable will, as she commanded the young man to do and say certain things which will bring to an end the sacrifice of innocent lives and establish a church whose God loves all men, women, and children as part of the Catholic religion. Our Lady of Guadalupe left Juan Diego with a tilma, which holds her image to this day. And just four years later, in 1535, in Turin, a shroud with the image of the face and body of a man was finally made public. 
Progressively developed photography has revealed that it holds the image of a crucified man who suffered with great dignity. Science has not been able to explain how these two images have lasted for so many centuries, nor how the image was first related to either the material of the tilma or the shroud. Yet they continue to radiate their visible message of the dignity of a very strong woman and the dignity of a very strong suffering man. If these two images are brought together in the light of faith, they show the true dignity of the woman and the true dignity of the man who in faith is the child that the pregnant woman was carrying. It's just striking to me that at the very beginning of the modern period, both of these images, which have still never been explained, appeared. And then you can see they inverted the stereotype. So the woman was asking Juan Diego to carry out her will. The man, as we believe in faith, suffered for others. So it was a very different revelation for those of us who believe it is a gift of God, than the, the philosophy was arguing generally. During the same time frame, in Europe, the Reformation began. In 1517 with Martin Luther, in 1520 with Ulrich Zwingli, 1531 with King Henry VIII, 1531 with John Calvin. Each man married, and in the marriage ceremony, his wife followed a new formula for the marriage which included a one-way requirement for the wife only to obey the husband as part of the marriage rite. Now, the Catholic Church up to that time had just used the same formula for men and women, which had nothing about obedience in it. So that was a change of man-woman relationship that occurred in the Reformed religions. Returning to early modern philosophy, several competing events occurred which radically shifted the conversation about women's identity in relation to man. In England, after the Reformation, an Anglican set of satires about the masculine woman and the feminine man, hic mulier and hec vir, for those of you who know Latin, became very popular along with cross-dressing and gender identity confusion often associated with Shakespeare's comedies. In Germany, a Lutheran satire on the concept of woman in the Bible used literal interpretations of phrases in scripture to prove that, quote, women are not human. That's the title of it in Latin. These satires were countered by equally satirical defenses of women against men up through the 20th century. And I have all those satires in there and what they say. And the last was Dorothy Sayers, who got into this satire. Very interesting reading. You know, you pick a lot from satires. I suppose it's like TV today. I mean, you see what the culture is thinking. More importantly, however, the Copernican revolution in astronomy, through the combined work of Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, overturned the Aristotelian theory of the heavy, passive Mother Earth for a new understanding, new understanding of Father Son as the stable Lord of the universe. Science, with the technical help of new lenses in the telescope, completely demolished Aristotle's cosmology and its insistence on the circular motion of planets, and instead discovered and proved with evidence the heliocentric theory of elliptical orbits. Also what demolished was Aristotle's theory of generation, with its insistence on woman's lack of contribution of seed to generation, providing only menstrual fluid, and on the man's immaterial contribution of only one male seed power to set the woman's menstrual blood. This is, Aristotle is, you know, 400 BC, and we're already up here in the 16, 1700 AD. So they still hadn't discovered exactly how generation worked. Even those who believed in some kind of a double seed theory based on Galen's or Lucretius' thought dismissed the active role of the mother's seed as either just secretions or weak infertile seed. However, the science of anatomy, through the combined work of Leonardo da Vinci, Vesalius, Fabricus, along with William Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood, further overturned Aristotle's theory of blood being heated up to become a single male seed power or female milk. And Tony von Leeuwenhoek in 1677, using a lens and a microscope to study the semen of a man with gonorrhea, fortuitously discovered multiple male seeds. 
This discovery added to the destruction of the Aristotelian theory that man's, the males contribute, contribute only a single immaterial seed power to generation. Finally, Carl Ernest von Baer in the 19th century reported to the St. Petersburg Academy of Simon, Science that he had discovered a female ovulum under a microscope at last. <laughs> that is a very long time, 19th century. <laughs> it took well over 2,000 years for Aristotle's claim of the lack of female seed and, his link, and the linking of this lack to women's natural inferiority to be corrected by science. However, as a result of the important self-correcting scientific discoveries about generation, Aristotle's theory was rejected by philosophers, particularly in the form, Reformed traditions. He just looked like a ridiculous fool, unfortunately. So everything was rejected by him. Hylomorphism, metaphysics, I mean, about him. Everything was rejected about him. So we have a problem now where people take a person, either say he's perfect or terrible. When this rejection, the metaphysical foundation, however, for the significant difference in equal dignity of men and women also disappeared. Scotism shifted the Aristotelian claim that matter was the principle of individuation to the claim that form is the principle of individuation. Descartes rejected all substantial forms. Francis Bacon argued that forms are figments of the human mind. Hobbes argued that a form is not an ontological reality, but simply an idea in the mind. Locke argued that substantial forms are just gibberish. And Hume concluded that metaphysics is nothing but sophistry and illusion. At the same time, Descartes' own philosophy promoted a dualism of mind, of unextended substance and body extended substance, that seemed to support a new foundation for a unisex equality of women and men. Initially, Descartes' approach implied an equality of women and men through its affirmation of a unisex mind as unextended substance, somehow separated from an unextended body, an extended body. Several women philosophers worked hard to find a principle of unity in the human being. There is nothing that held it together. It was a straight dualism of a new form. Plato's was a dualism too, but this is not built on Plato. It's a different foundation. Princess Elizabeth of, of Bohemia pressed Descartes in her correspondence to explain how the mind and body interacted. And Conway turned to Neoplatonism for a principle of unity. And Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle, tried unsuccessfully to find a principle of unity through atomism. This is a little parentheses here. But in my view, the contemporary accusation of Descartes as a flight from woman is false. I believe he had the greatest respect for women and encouraged them to develop their capacities for philosophical engagement about topics of importance to him. This Cartesian revolution in philosophy, however, shows that women and men equally have the higher rational powers of intellect and will. Other philosophers, like Mary Estelle, Poulain de la Barre, Elena Lucrezia Coronaro Piscopia, understood the value of Cartesianism, Cartes, sorry, Cartesianism to argue for women's equal access to higher education. Estelle also offered a strong critique of the practice in England that at marriage, following the principle that the two become one person, all of women's property come under the control of her husband. Still others, like Olympe de Gouze and the Marquis de Condorcet, grasped the Cartesian defense of a unisex reason to argue for women's equal access to citizenship, which did not happen. In the meantime, although there were no new developments in Catholic writings about sex and gender identity, a new kind of implicit integral complementarity began to emerge in both Europe and the New World, with women and men religious founders working together in lived, chaste, integral complementarity. There was a spiritual synergy among the men and women religious founders, which embodied an equal dignity with significant difference and spiritually generative creativity in founding new forms of religious life, especially oriented towards education and healthcare. The intellectual post-Cartesian battle 
over sex and gender identity among reform authors deteriorated rapidly from unisex theory into a theory of what I call fractional complementarity with a hidden traditional polarity of natural male superiority over the female. Jean-Jacques Rousseau articulated such a fractional view of the two genders, adding up to one human being in marriage. He argued that the female provides opinions about the moment, emotions, senses, tastes, and sentiments, and the male provides ideas, arguments, morality, and understanding in the future. He said this relation produces only a single moral person. Mary Wollstonecraft directly critiqued Rousseau's fractional complementarity with its hidden superior evaluation of man over woman. Immanuel Kant followed Rousseau's lead and argued that in marriage, the two constitute a single moral person, which is animated and governed by the understanding of the man and the taste of the woman. This position is found in Kant's pre-critical works, his lectures on ethics, and in his later essay, essay on what is enlightenment. Not surprisingly, 19th century philosophers like Schopenhauer, Hegel, and Kierkegaard provided their own versions of the same fractional complementarity with a hidden traditional polarity. Nietzsche is more complex with a theory of four kinds of ambivalence about women in relation to man. Kant's disciple, Theodor von Hippel, agrees with Kant's position that in marriage the two become just one person, but he deviates from his mentor by supporting women's higher education and access to citizenship. John Stuart Mill attempts to reform traditional polarity within a fractional complementarity theory by arguing for the equal valuation of the engendered contribution of a woman and man. He also introduced the first official bill into the bill British Parliament that a legal subordination of the female sex to the male is wrong in itself and should be replaced by a principle of perfect equality. When the field of psychology began to advance, we discover in two of its most famous developers a reversion to new variations on traditional polarity which always selects a primary characteristic in woman as inferior to the analogous characteristic in man. Freud cho chose the male anatomy as superior to the female anatomy, and a woman's desire for a child as the source of her drive to recover the anatomy she lacks. She's characterized by passivity and man by activity. Carl Jung seemed at first glance to bring a greater balance into the evaluation of feminine and masculine characteristics in the psyche, and to argue that a human being needs to develop both feminine and masculine characteristics. Yet, he describes the projected logos, which allows women to analyze and make conceptual distinctions as, quote, only a regrettable accident, and the projected eros in men as simply an imitation of women's ability to make connections. Authors in modern philosophy never found a way to defend the integral unity of a single human being. Therefore, it's not surprising that the theories of the relation of a woman and man should slide continuously into a fractional sex complementarity with its hidden superiority of the male. It will take some further developments in science and philosophy for a foundation for the integral complementarity of a woman and man as two equal but significantly different kinds of persons to be discovered and developed. And we're going to take a five minute break here. And you can discuss, if you would, with your neighbor. I, we have two thoughts. One question is, is there anything you've learned that you didn't know before? Secondly, do you have any questions from what you've learned or not learned? What you're going to see here, and I'll just explain to you a little bit about the I have the charts of Bernard Lonergan and then also um, Edith Stein and Carol Boitua. In the book, I have charts just about everybody that developed the theory, but you know, I just picked these as examples so that you can see the, the development that had to occur and did, that did occur. So that just shows you kind of what's there. In the 20th, early 20th century, a great intellectual renewal in Catholic philosophy drew several converts to the Catholic faith. In 1906, Jacques and Raïs Maritain, 
1914, Dietrich von Hildebrand. 1922, Edith Stein. 1926, Gertrude von Lefort. And 1929, Gabriel Marcel. The important work of other Catholic philosophers like Emmanuel Mounier and Bernard Lonergan interwove with these conversions to provide an extraordinary momentum for the true development of hylomorphism and of integral gender complementarity. So this was after 200 years of nothing much being produced by Catholic writers during the reform period. Each one of these Catholic philosophers provided at least one important factor and often several important factors foundational for the defense of an integral complementarity of a woman and a man. While the details of their contributions are found in the final volume of the concept of woman, a short indication will be given here. Jacques and Raisa Maritain established Thomistic Circle meetings in their home on a regular basis for over 20 years for the systematic renewal of Thomistic metaphysics and its application to the world. And Raisa Samaritan, she wrote in her journal that Jacques has decided that he has to take Thomistic philosophy and separate it from theology, which has kind of kept it bound so it couldn't develop in its own autonomous way. So that's what Neo-Thomism was. It's the attempt to take Thomism and develop the philosophy of it. It had to be in union with what the church taught in terms of dogma, but it needed to become independent from theology. And so that's really what led to Fetus et Ratio also in John Paul II's encyclical. <clears throat> All right, Dietrich von Hildebrand, shortly after Niels Bohr, referred to the wave particle theory of complementarity in physics. He gave a lecture on Lake Como. But Dietrich von Hildebrand, all of these people were very interested in atomic science, quantum physics, all that. He gave a lecture on marriage in which he stated that a man and a woman in marriage are, quote, metaphysical complements. The word, I looked everywhere to see when did the word complementarity start to come. And it was right after Niels Bohr, two years after Niels Bohr gave that lecture, where he used the word complementarity of physics, the, the um, two different ways of looking at light as a wave or a particle. So that's where I traced it. It was from physics that it came, the concept. But Dietrich von Hildebrand immediately applied it to marriage of woman and man. As, so this lecture was followed by a 1929 book of the same title, and he was the first to give the integral spiritual relation of a woman and man its name of metaphysical complementarity. Bernard Lonergan then wrote a review of the English translation of Hildebrand's book on marriage for a Quebec Catholic newspaper in 1942. And the next year, he integrated developments in science to elaborate a full description of the complementarity of woman and man in increasingly hierarchical levels of their respective beings. He corrected Aristotle's error that all forms are immaterial by introducing material conjugate forms at different levels of physics, chemistry, biology, human psychology, and anthropology, hierarchically organized in an Im by an immaterial central form. That's a technical way of saying we have a form that's our central form, our soul, which organizes all the forms in our body, hydrogen atoms, fluids, systems, everything at hierarchical levels where the laws of each level is respected by the lower. So that's the two-page chart I have here of, of Lonergan's theory. <clears throat> he describes those things of insight <clears throat> and also in a special uh, article that he wrote shortly after he reviewed von Hildebrand's book. And that um, was an article that talked about marriage and, and so on and how when you're baptized, <clears throat> you're raised to even a higher level by being brought into the body of Christ, spiritually. So you can see his mind. I mean, he was a genius. And so what I tried to set out in the charts, he didn't use charts. I just put his theory in charts so that I can understand that. So anyway, it's something we haven't got time to look at here. But <clears throat> it's a great advancement on hylomorphism. And it is a way of explaining how sex and gender develops, since that's the big issue here that we're looking at. You can see it develops a little by little, 
in that field of the category of the different uh, forms in your body organized by higher forms and things. So the male and female just starts to show on the level of chemistry where you have hormones. The level of biology, it gets more complicated. You have chromosomes, you have all these different things that are organized by the reproductive system. And then the psychology, how like women know your cycles, when you ovulate, you become aware of, usually when women ovulate, that's when they want to have sexual intercourse, if you know the natural family planning. And on the other hand, if you have a drop in your hormones, you feel depressed and a little sad, things like that. So all these things impact your psyche. They can help you understand yourself a bit more. But then you are, you have, and you have your, at the anthropology of your section of your socialized growing up as male or female in a particular family, culture, whatever. The philosophy, though, you have free will and intellect, which are non-material. The brain is there, but it's different from the intellect and the will. And so you have to understand those levels of philosophy and to see what he means by it. But that's how he, he develops the way of describing sexual and gender differentiation. Okay? So I'm going to move on, or we'll never finish. <laughs> Gabriel Marcel worked on the recovery of the meaning of form in concrete situations of the human family. He elaborated essential qualities of a person, such as availability to another and engaging in acts of creative fidelity. Finally, he described the form of fatherhood as a free will adoption of a child as mine with a subsequent desire to protect and provide for the child. Marcel collaborated with, collaborated with Maritain and Emmanuel Mounier in writing what they called a personalist manifesto. Mounier understood the family to be the basic community in which the woman, who is also a person, is called to the development of her whole personality for the good of society. Edith Stein, with Dietrich von Hildebrand, brought the study of phenomenology to bear on woman's identity, exploring the content of a woman and man's psyches in her early lectures on women. She described in some detail what she considered to be positive and negative feminine or masculine characteristics, and I've got a little chart of that for you to look at if you want to see. In this context, she also identifies different challenges for a man and for a woman. A man's challenge is to avoid the negative tendency to dominate a woman, and the woman's challenge is to avoid the negative tendency to want to possess her husband or children. Also positively, a woman has a disposition to pay attention to and foster the growth of persons in her own area of responsibility. This characteristic, which she calls a woman's ethos, later becomes adopted by John Paul II as the root of the feminine genius. These various contributions are elaborated in the handout. Now, several, at the same time as we had this incredible Catholic renewal, several philosophers tried to separate the theme of humanism from its Catholic origins in Renaissance philosophy for their own purposes, which were usually ideological, a found, foundation for a unisex theory. Not always, but often. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels I'm getting, I'm trying to rush, I'm sorry, I'm just going to slow down here. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels provided arguments for a Marxist humanism and feminism, which justified destroying persons of upper classes, religion, and family as enemies. They were joined by Marxist feminists such as Marlene Dixon and Shulamuth Firestone, who perceived what they called the tyranny of reproduction and childbearing as obstacles for women's full development. I noticed the bookstore out there has a book for sale called Women in Christ, and it's an anthology of lectures um, on basically John Paul II's work by women scholars of different disciplines. But I do have an article in there called Can Feminism Be a Humanism, which I go, where I go through all these different kinds of humanisms, Marxist, secular, existential, you know, in more detail. So again, not so much in the book, but in that, that other one. John Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir publicly rejected their Christian and Catholic background to produce a systematic atheism in which they promoted 
an existential humanism, it's called it that, in which the human being is the only lawgiver. There's no human nature and no feminine nature. Bovar did not begin, did begin an interdisciplinary approach to women's studies, but she and Sartre both saw no difficulty in killing innocent persons or developing human beings, and they instrumentally, instrumentally used others for their own sexual enjoyment, sharing the details of relations with one another. Michel Foucault is part of the sea tide that swept away the necessary metaphysical foundation for the human person and gender. And he concludes, ironically, that if some event were to cause them to crumble, that man would be erased like a face drawn at the edge of the sea. He, along with Gail Rubin, oriented their professional and personal identities towards the San Francisco bathhouse scenes of sexual activity. Mary Daly also publicly walked out on her Catholic faith at Harvard University. She, proposed, she chose to promote a theory of reverse sex polarity, which defended the natural superiority of women over men. Similar to traditional sex polarity theories, sorry, similar to traditional sex polarity theory, theorists like Lionel Tiger, who chose the hormone testosterone to defend the spirituality of men. Oh, sorry, I'm getting tired, you can tell. <laughs> the superiority of men over women. Reverse sex polarity theorists often chose one specific characteristic of woman. Radical feminists like Valerie Solinas tried to promote the natural superiority of women over men because of the strength of XX over the XY chromosome. Others chose the better value of estrogen over testosterone to justify their argument for the superiority of women over men. These various versions of polarity theory are a corruption of the true dignity and relation of women and men. Another kind of corruption of humanism, however, now appears to be holding on with some vigor. Ferdinand Schiller, William James, and John Dewey introduced what is now broadly called secular or pragmatic humanism. Schiller defined this theory as rejecting any concept of objective truth and instead seeking truths, seeing how truths make themselves as we go. Modern humanism, according to Cor Corliss Lamont's extensive treatment of the subject, states that the supernatural does not exist and that human happ happiness is found only in success which is a continuing reconstruction of experience. In 1973, a new humanist manifesto was published that claims that ethics needs no other sanction than that stemming from human need and interest. The National Organization of Women now was founded from the roots of secular humanism with a similar set of values. In this context, it is not surprising that a great prominence is given to abortion but its members have to argue that the unborn are not human in order to cling to their other image of a humanism that protects and defends the rights of others. Another very important development has roots in secular humanism. It also has serious consequences for the concept of woman and of man in Western thought. This theory began outside of philosophy in the origins of a sex ideology through the work of the entomologist Alfred Kinsey, and the origins of a gender ideology through the work of the psychologist John Munney. Both Kinsey and Munney rejected their reformed Christian upbringing and became confirmed atheists. Both used data samples that were contaminated, and both deceptively promoted their faulty research results. This deception of the public has now been well documented, but it is important to realize how far the deception went to destroy the truth about woman and man and the family. Both Kinsey and Money were also involved in promoting child abuse and pornography. These intentional acts harmed the dignity of adults and children. Kinsey studied sexual activity as a human animal, quote, outlet and he decided to quantify all aspects of a man's, woman's, and child's sexual outlets. 
His sample groups of males included, in one group, serial rapists in prison, pedophiles, single men, married men, and male prostitutes. A, a similar distortion of the group of females led his work to be more a pseudoscience than the hard science he and the media, like the New York Times and Time Magazine, claimed. Kinsey's single-minded promotion of quantitative amounts of sexual activities as so-called healthy outlets without regard to human relations became a cultural ideology not only in the United States but also in Europe. John Money graduated from Harvard University with a doctorate in psychology on the study of hermaphrodites. Shortly after its completion, he was hired by Johns Hopkins University Medical School to join a newly formed medical team at a gender clinic. He published a paper arguing directly from the study of 131 intersexed individuals to the conclusion about normal males and females, namely that gender identity is environmentally caused during the first two years of life. He also tried to turn a normal boy with a botched circumcision into a girl. He asked the parents not to tell the truth to this boy and to his identical twin. While this experiment was a terrible failure, Dr. Money, along with the popular media, continued to herald its success. Dr. Money's gender identity theory is filled with several philosophical errors. I'll just name four. One, arguing from the exception that some children born with ambiguous genitalia could, with medical intervention, become male or female, to the rule that all children with normal sex identity from birth could become either male or female in gender. Michel Foucault made the same error of reasoning when he argued from the single exception of the hermaphrodite Alexina Hercule Barbine to the rule that no children should have a sex as male or female. The second error of reasoning, arguing from multiple parts, sexes and genders, to the whole. Money describes the embryo and the early fetus as selecting detours in the road. The question a philosopher has to ask is how does an unconscious part of a being select anything? Three, arguing from artificial division gender identity role, G-I-R, to fractured identity by introducing a new Cartesian dualism, which he says, while gender role is public, gender identity is completely private. Four, arguing directly from animal behavior of monkeys to human behavior, that early sexual experience in children is better preparation for successful adult sex activity. Margaret Mead supported Dr. John Money's research promoting adult and sexual relations. She revolutionized methodologies in the field of anthropology when she studied the different ways in which cultures patterned expected behavior of males and females. Her research led her to conclude that sex roles and sex styles were simply culturally learned and artificially assigned. In a reflection on what a language would be like that had 13 genders, she said she's familiar with masculine and feminine and neuter, but asked what in the world are the other 10. She may have set the stage by saying this for a mutation of gender to begin. Soon after their publication, Dr. Money's contaminated research results became embedded into secular feminist textbooks in the social sciences. And I, I looked at the a range of textbooks, and it wasn't there before, and all of a sudden, you saw them quoting Dr. Money's work, as if it was a great success, and what he said was true. So I say, as a virus attaches itself to a host cell, the gender ideology virus attached itself to feminist thinking and actions. And in this way, gender ideology mutated from a more isolated phenomenon into the broader culture of the women's movement. Following Money's research, Kate Millett introduced the term gender as completely arbitrary in her book, Sexual Politics. She was a founding member of NOW. Alice Rossi, a sociologist, participated in the symposium at John Hopkins with both Dr. Money and Masters and Johnson. 
She was also a founding member of the National Organization of Women, or NOW. Textbooks appeared on the subject of gender and endomethodological approach. They were published in America, Canada, England, and Australia by interdisciplinary teams who quoted John Money's theories and concluded that gender identity is, quote, self-attribution of gender. At the same time, as the above-mentioned corruptions of the identity of the human person as a soul-body composite identity, always or for the most part as female or male, woman or man, a new vigor emerged in Catholic positions about the human being and about the relation of woman and man in marriage. In your handout, there's a comprehensive copy of a summary of Carl Voigt's St. John Paul's concept of woman in relation to man. I'm not going to go through it. They're just there for you to see. By glancing at it, you can see how he became the integrator of many of the contributions of previous philosophers by his claim that the ontological, which means in the being, complementarity of a woman and man, integrates four levels of complementarity, biological, individual, personal, and spiritual. He did differ from previous authors, especially Edith Stein, in this one situation by never, ever, ever attributing a feminine characteristic to a man or a masculine characteristic to a woman. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find it. Instead, he said that masculine was simply a, way of, a man's way of acting in the world and feminine a woman's way of acting in the world. He called for a new feminism which welcomed new life and defended its flourishing by the creative exercise of each woman's feminine genius. The writings of Catholic journalists and scholars, together with the carefully developed philosophy of Carol Wojtyla, Pope John Paul's theology of the body, mapped what I call the sex and gender ideology virus. The spread of sex and gender ideology went through the United Nations preliminary conferences from 1968 in Tehran, 74 Bucharest, 75 Mexico City, 80 Copenhagen, 1985 Nairobi, and 1995 Beijing. Dr. Margaret Peters, Dale O'Leary, and Marianne Glendon, as head of the Vatican delegation to the United Nations World Congress on Women in Beijing, collaborated collaborated with Pope John Paul to stop the expanding research of the attempt to redefine gender. When the attempt of an American secular feminist, Bella Abzug, reached, um, the, entered the preface of getting multiple genders, or 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30 genders, um, the United, to trying to pass it, Marianne Glendon and the Vatican delegation worked with other nations to try to get past the decision that gender will remain with, quote, its usual meaning, i.e., at that time, of two genders, male and female. But it's still out there <laughs> waiting to, get, to take over the United Nations. And then by making it a right in the United Nations to bring it back to every country that would then have to conform what the United, States, United Nations says is a right. I've got two more pages. Is there time, or, or do you think I should stop? I notice people are leaving. I don't <laughs> want to drive them away. Quickly? Okay, I'll quickly summarize. Okay. Um, several other Catholic scholars contributed. G.E.M. Anscombe, Alice von Hildebrand, Norris Clark, Hans von, von, Urs von Balthasar, Father Come. They're all in the book. you know. And then Pope Benedict talked about Eris and Agape, Pope Francis, just last week, October 5th, gave an address to the Pontifical Academy for Life where he warns against the biological and psychological man man manipulation of sex difference and how it's likely to dismantle the source of energy that nourishes the alliance of man and woman and makes it creative and fruitful. So I'll just give a, a couple of conclusions of my own thinking. It's important to realize that the root of the word gender is gen, G-E-N. -G it means to breed, it means, and it's in revolution, sorry, I'm trying to go too fast. It's in the book of Revelation and scriptures and ancient Greek Aristotelian philosophy. Only the syn synergetic union of a male and female human being can contribute in cooperation with God to the development of another person through generation. The word gender and gender reality includes sex identity. Gender reality includes the whole person, woman and man. 
gender, sorry, gender reality, gender ideology is built on a false revisionary metaphysical foundation which collapses into fragments or disconnected parts. In contrast, gender reality is based on a true metaphysical foundation. Gender reality needs a descriptive metaphysics based on real beings in the world. It cannot be based on a revisionary metaphysics which tries to make the world conform to some idea invented by a human mind. A true descriptive metaphysics is to be found in a vitalized Thomism, which is flexible enough to incorporate advances in contemporary science and phenomenology. It's also able to be full of love, compassion, and respect for the dignity of persons who suffer from an ambiguous development in their sex and gender identity, those persons who fall outside of, for the most part, exception that science has always recognized. Each one of these persons created with dignity in the image and likeness of God and is called into a relation of love with the invitation to the resurrection of the body, the communion of saints, and eternal life. Thank you very much.